Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for joining us for the Empire Club's Spirit of Pioneers series. Many of you may be asking yourself, what is behind the naming of the series? The definition of a pioneer is an individual who ventures into the unknown or unclaimed territory and opens new areas of thought, research, and development. Pioneers redefine convention and push the capabilities of humankind. Today, we are proud to host such an individual, a pioneer in the semiconductor industry leading the development of a groundbreaking method for chip manufacturers to build faster, more efficient microprocessors used in laptops, cell phones, and other electronic devices. It is now my delight and pleasure to introduce Poet Technologies Executive Chairman and Interim CEO, Mr. Peter Capetti. Mr. Capetti will be introducing our guest speaker today. Mr. Capetti has over 25 years of capital markets and management experience in key leadership roles. He has been the chief architect and strategist in the transformation of Poet Technologies since 2012. Mr. Copetti was responsible for recapitalization of the company and refocusing its vision to become a leading platform innovator in the semiconductor industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Peter Copetti. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Empire Club, our sponsoring host, IBK, thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'd like to acknowledge the members of my senior executive team that are here today, along with our board of directors who are sitting at various tables. And I'd like to especially acknowledge all our shareholders, those who are here and those who are not. The, the company itself uh, ex is extremely appreciative of your, of your support. Uh, most of us here have heard of Moore's Law. Uh, for those who haven't, basically, Moore's Law states that the number of transistors on a chip will double every couple of years, and the performance of computing devices follows a corresponding pace. It's similar to the semiconductor, it would be similar to the semiconductor speedometer of the future, if you will. For the last 50 years, Moore's Law has held true, but not anymore. Look at your cell phones. Every time we upgrade the cell phone, what do we got? Maybe a, maybe a thinner screen, a better camera for sure, but the, the improvements are, are far and few between. Our batteries, they never seem to last. Why? Because Moore's Law is done. It's over. What we need is a paradigm shift, magnitudes of orders of improvement in speed, power, and consu consumption, all with the benefits of lower manufacturing costs and compatibility with existing manufacturing tool sets. Poet is the only true solution. That paradigm shift is exactly what Dr. Jeffrey Taylor laid out to me in May of 2012, when Mr. Mr. Benadiba and I first met him at the University of Connecticut. At that time, Poet Technologies did not exist. The company was called Opal Solar, and it was saddled in debt, focused on solar with Dr. Taylor's technology in the background. There were few on the board in senior management who believed those few are still with the company today. But those few persuaded me to look under the hood. What I found was a Ferrari. Now I had to look what the, who was driving the car. Dr. Taylor definitely had all the credentials, 30 years of experience in electronic and optical device physics, over 150 papers in the world's most respected journals, and scores of patents widely regarded as the world's leading authority on gallium arsenide solid-state physics. Previously a distinguished member of the technical staff at AT&T Bell Labs, developing key technology for 3.5 materials. At Honeywell and Texas Instruments, he helped to develop critical optical technology for the Jupiter orbital probe, as well as innovation in very large-scale integrated devices. But what struck me when I talked to Dr. Taylor was this. His tenacity over more than two decades to bring that solution to technical feasibility. His vision to look out and know that the world would need such a solution when others gave up. His foresight to make that solution easily adaptable by industry today. He is the reason why I joined Poet. I did so to change the, the, to change the semiconductor world and take Poet over the goal line. Fast forward to where the company is now. 
We've got over 11 million in cash with no debt. What I've done is surrounded myself with great people. My board of directors is second to none. Our UConn team, unmatched. My senior executive team can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any team in the industry, and they are doing that just, just as, as we speak. But at the epicenter of all that is poet stands a brilliant mind, a great person, relentless in his belief of poets. We talk all the time. He is constantly working. His enthusiasm and conviction are unwavering. Ladies and gentlemen, the vision has become real. Can we say Taylor's Law for the next 50 years? <laughs> Welcome to the future of the semiconductor industry as devised by Poet Technology, as devised by Dr. Taylor. He has proven this, that although we may not be able to predict the future, we sure can invent it. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Scientist of Poet Technologies, a native son of Canada, my friend and colleague, Dr. Jeff Taylor. Well, thank you very much, Peter. <clears throat> um, it's an honor and a privilege for me to uh, be able to speak to you today. Um, and I, I would like to thank Bill White and the, uh, uh, and the Empire Club for, for this opportunity. Um, this is, a, as Peter alluded to, this is an exciting time for, uh, for the company Poet Technologies. And it's appropriate for me at this time to um, recognize the contributions of both uh, Peter and Mark Benediba um, over the last two years in redirecting the company. Uh, basically, uh, Peter, who has exercised the leadership uh, role, uh, was needed at this critical time, and uh, he rose to the occasion. So, um, I want to start then with, um, um, let's see how this thing works. Is that the right one? Oh, maybe that's not the right one. Okay. It's right there. There's a screen right there. Oh, okay. Uh, so which one is it? Okay, that's the left one. Okay, so uh, the topics I want to uh, dwell on are um, the um, silicon device evolution from uh, somewhere around the year 2000 uh, to give you uh, an idea of near term or at least the last 10 years, 10, 13 years. Um, I'm going to talk about the transition from metal to fiber. Um, meaning the transition from electrical to optical. Then what is POET? And, and then what will the electrical opti uh, optical interface be um, as we uh, enter this new, new era in, in circuit design? Um, and then how will POET impact the design? And then I want to talk about a couple of examples. And one is the mobile system. It's a major market for um, optoelectronics. And, um, and Moore's Law, where it's uh, come from, and, and, and what, what's next. So what I'm showing here is a snapshot of um, um, the things that have been happening, um, and mostly um, provided by Intel, as you can see here, in the reduction in gate length this is the feature size. This is what drives the performance of the, of the integrated circuit. And you can see that it's, uh, it's been coming down uh, from uh, the year 2003 down to 2011. That's when, when this was provided. Uh, some of the gate numbers there, the feature sizes, I don't think are quite correct. Over in the left-hand corner, there's a little table. You can see how the node relates to the gate length. But nevertheless, at, um, at 22 nanometers, uh, the, these features are incredibly small. Probably at 22, I think, is, is down there around, around 20 nanometers. So that gives you an idea. And then here's the, um, the way that it's been characterized in the industry uh, in terms of, of the, the, new, the new innovations that have, that have uh, driven silicon from you know the 2000 year 2000 to the present, and um, they have made numerous innovations, and you can see them there. Um, 
finalizing in, in the latest <coughs> version in a device called the FinFET, which is a, um, the device goes three-dimensional, it comes out of the surface, and uh, it allows you to uh, pinch off, re re get more, more leakage reduction than, than you could previously. But nevertheless, um, the FinFET is, has a, a limited a lifetime because the feature size is now um, at, at its um, at, at a place where it can't, has no room to go. So uh, this is all summarized in this roadmap. This is an industry standard thing that, that just shows you. This is the manifestation of Moore's Law, and you can see that in the, in the year 2012, and, and certainly by now, it's flatlined, and there's really no more capability there. Um, and now I want to do a little bit here about uh, talking about the limitations of, of copper wiring. So um, this, this just shows you how as the frequency goes up, <clears throat> then the length of that you can propagate on the, on the copper uh, is coming down. And this shows you 20, 20 inches at 18 gigahertz is about your limit. And um, uh, and, and it's just going to get worse. Uh, the future speeds are, are, are looking away above 18 gigahertz. So this is a, a clearly a major problem. And then on the, on the counter side, think about what's happening with optical. And um, this shows you how, how optical connections have been moving um, with with uh, time and with decreasing distances, because distances de decrease over time. As we go from the, um, the uh, long distance connections, uh, fiber connections over large distances, and, and this comes down to uh, a rack-to-rack -rack connection, and as that dash line moves to the right, it's gonna go to a, from, a, from a board to a board, and then finally from a chip to a chip. And the chip to chip um, function is what we see being addressed today. And, um, and the point is clearly that if you're going to do chip to chip connections, then you better have an optical component on your chip. Otherwise, you, you have a real conundrum. Okay, so that's, that's where POET comes into the picture. Um, so what is POET? So it's a, it's a unique monolithic approach to integration of both optical and electrical devices. Uh, it's done on a gallium arsenide substrate and has a single fabrication sequence. Uh, I don't want to dwell on the, on the nitty gritty here too much, but these are some of the highlights. Um, Complementary logic, which is what we have today with CMOS, so we need to be able to to compete, to do the same functions, but do them in a, in a much uh, a faster with lower power. Um, POET provides the optical devices and the means to connect them uh, to move light around inside the chip. And uh, obviously, we do this with a much improved speed and lower power. It um, has unique vertical topologies for density improvement, and, um, and new functionality in form of thyristors. And uh, last but not least, it, it is a fully compatible with existing semiconductor technology um, so that it can make this transition in a, in a competitive way. So now we get into the specifics. I uh, hope not too much detail here. I don't want to uh, put anyone to sleep, but um, we have three different ways of, of doing these interfaces, trying to get from the fiber into the chip and vice versa. So one of them um, is uh, commercial today, at least to some extent, and this is uh, the company Luxterra. The, the, the concept is uh, you create a silicon chip uh, which integrates the modulators and detectors and you combine it with a discrete laser, external laser. And then you try your darndest to, to make the transmit drive and the receive amplifier on that same chip, but 
in the event that that doesn't work for you, then you have to combine these things with a hybrid packaging approach. And, um, and the only way to, to go to a shorter reach and higher speed is um, you need higher power. So, or to get the higher speed, you need shorter reach and, and, and higher power. That means you need to bring these things together as close as you can, um, but there's, there's only so much you can do. The other approach, number two, is a, is a company called OneChip, and there it's a very similar situation. You, you, you use your existing CMOS electronics and you combine this with a, a 3.5 chip as opposed to the silicon photonics chip. And then, of course, there's the POET approach. And in this case, we create a, uh, a single chip where we integrate these components together. And, um, and then with a fiber attach, electrical bonding, everything is, is within the chip and the limitations are eliminated in terms of um, connections. So let's look a little bit further at Luxterra. And you can see on the left-hand side, this is what they call their single chip solution, but actually it's six inches on a side, so it's really a single board solution, not a chip solution. And what they have now resorted to is what you see on the right, which is hybrid integration of the photonics and electronics. And you can see at the bottom, with the, the green arrow that actually what's happening here is that the, they're using copper pillars to connect these two chips together. So your interconnect distance now is the dimensions of that pillar. So that, that's about as far as you can go. So then here you can see um, a little more detail. At the bottom, we show you a little box with the yellow pedestal on the side. That's a commercial laser that's in a little package that's on the order of an inch and a half by, by an inch and a half, and that sits on top of this board, and you can see the laser input arrow, so you, and then you see to the, on the bottom to the right, there's the laser inside the package. It's that little chip on one side of the blue sphere, which is your lens, and the lens gathers the light, it's collimated, and then it reflects off uh, a 45 degree surface and is directed down into the chip where it has to couple in where it says laser input on the pink, on, 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 on the pink board. Um, that is a very difficult and, and expensive process. Here's one chip, the one chip solution. Again, very similar. You see the, um, you have a one chip uh, photonic integrated circuit. So that combines your optical devices, you may have a laser detector and a grating, and then you have all the electronic devices that are required to, to, to uh, use that chip. You have a transceiver, microcontroller, laser driver, et cetera, trans impedance amplifier. They all get put into that package, which you see in the lower right, and clearly that's a, an expensive, uh, expensive uh, proposition. And then here's the POET solution, and you can see we have fibers coming into the chip from the, from the bottom side, and you have um, four lasers, four detectors, or four, four, four uh, uh, transmission channels, four receive channels. The laser channel is a uh, rectangular laser, it's coupled to a, to a um, straight waveguide and the straight waveguide is driven by the, uh, the, 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 um, the CH-FET interface circuit, and, but what it does is uh, modulate the reflectivity of that laser and uh, sends the data onto the fiber. For the uh, corresponding receive circuit, you see there is a, 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 an SOA, that's a semiconductor optical amplifier. You take all the gain in the optical space, and then you go into the receiver, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, but you notice how compact and, and close together everything is and a huge uh, reduction in area there. So now I have two examples. And um, the first one is um, addressing the problem of distributing the clock in an integrated circuit. And um, this is a problem 
that every, everyone in the industry is now facing. Um, the clock rates are, have saturated, and the only way to, to make improvements now is to distribute this clock optically. And you can see the yellow pattern. It basically is a, an optical conduit, so it's a waveguide, and <coughs> that light is distributed to all, the, to all the extremities of those H's. So you have 16 of those in total there. And the light is, th th these are, <coughs> this is experimentation that's actually going on now in the industry. Uh, laser input is coming in from the left um, from an external source, and it makes its way to all those extremities, and then it has to go on, has to be uh, converted to electrical form and becomes an electrical clock. So. Here's the circuit that is required to make that conversion. You can see it in the, in the B portion. You've got, you've got uh, what we call a TIA amplifier, and you've got uh, six or seven limiting amplifiers and an output amplifier. That whole thing is in the top, um, in, 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 in the top, I guess, oh, what happened there? Um, can I get this to, oh, maybe I can't. Okay, I, I was just going to show that in the, um, if we go, go here, in the, in, in the top right there, you see the CMOS amplifier designation. That's a, an area in the circuit that's about 700 by, by 200 microns and contains um, something over 100 transistors in there. Um, and that's to make one conversion. That's, that's not a prescription for, that you can expand upon. It's very limiting. Here's how you would do it in, in the POET technology. So you have the light coming in. <clears throat> first, first of all, the light, of course, is generated on the chip, but then it's distributed in a waveguide, and you see it coming in on the, on the, uh, the top left, the optical input, and it comes in. It, it couples into uh, a waveguide that goes in a circle around that around that device, it's called a whispering gallery mode. And as it circulates, it absorbs. <coughs> and um, the circuit you, you see over to the right there shows it's a, it's a thyristor with uh, uh, three transistors to control it. And just below that, you'll see the, 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 the waveform. So power in gives you voltage out. And What's happening is the thyristor in the lower right is making the transition from A to B and back to A because of the ability of the two transistors to, uh, to turn that device off when the, when the light goes off. And uh, so the whole, the whole function is performed in that yellow uh, cross section you see down below, which is about 20 microns in diameter. So you can do the, do the calculation, 20 micron diameter versus 700 by 200. Um, a huge saving in area and power and improvement in speed. Um, and another, another example, which is um, something we can all identify with, is in the mobile uh, system market, mobile electronic systems. And um, here's a typical breakdown of, of what's in a mobile device today. And um, you, you, you're transmitting by RF, that's, that's your Wi-Fi solution. Um, so that's the, the radio frequency block, that's the, the yellow one. Today that's in gallium arsenide components. And then you convert, do, do a down conversion to uh, retrieve the data, eliminate the carrier in the, in the blue section, that's called the baseband. And then it goes into the, the red block, which is your the computer in your phone, and and that's uh, connected to various other auxiliary circuits of, of memory, which you see down the, on the bottom, <clears throat> the bottom of the of the slide there. So, uh, if we want to look at that in a little more detail, you could see here. This is and I don't don't try to read all these blocks. I just want to show you that th this is the level of complexity. Inside your inside your cell phone, and and that processor there has numerous CPUs on it that are all chips. So all those chips have to be mounted, connected, interfaced, etc., and then interface also with the, with the RF portion over on the right hand side. 
So with a, with a poet chip, uh, all these functions can be combined into one single cell phone chip. And uh, we just diagrammatically show it like that. So that's the poet-enabled architecture. So those are the examples I want to show. And then I, I want to make a, um, a summary of the, of the highlights of the, of the poet integrated circuit, the main features that you can, you know, people will become familiar with these as we, as we address these various applications. But um, we have a number of new features. And um, a lot of it's based on thyristor clocking. It's, uh, it's interesting, the, uh, the thyristor was originally pursued by Shockley back in the, in, in the early 50s when he went to uh, California to, to start a company. He thought the thyristor was uh, what he called the four-layer diode was gonna become the mainstream uh, in, the, in the industry and it turned out he was, he was wrong, and it was really the, the MOSFET and the BJT that were going to become dominant. Um, and that was all because he didn't know how to remove charge quickly from the, from the thyristor. And um, consequently, it was, it was a slow device. And what, uh, what Poet has done is come back to that problem and, and learned how to remove the charge quickly. And so Shockley's original ideas were actually, are actually coming, coming to life now in the, in, in the POET technology. So we have uh, all these different capabilities of multi-wavelength interconnect, um, 3D vertical in interconnect using uh, vertical cavities, um, new architectures based on AD and DA conversion that are enabled by the, by the uh, unique optical capability. Um, a number of, of points, and I, I won't uh, go into all of those. But the main one at the bottom is when we're at the, the 10 nanometer feature side, which is where the industry is today, or very close to it, then the, the quantum size effects will now enable single electron transistors. This means that the, these devices are so small that tunneling can be used inside the devices to isolate single charges. And uh, this has got uh, profound implications for the um, utilization of spin for future qubits, which are the basis for optical computing. Uh, not optical computing, quantum computing, sorry. Yeah. So what I've tried to do here is put some perspective on the timeline and, uh, and the, the Moore's Law paradigm that has been in place now for, for many years, um, basically from 1965 to, to the present, almost 50 years of uh, feature scaling or uh, size reduction um, set by Moore's Law. And um, in 2015, going forward, um, and how far we can see, I mean, that's conjecture, but so a poet is, uh, is a new paradigm. And the paradigm is that there's no, more, no longer feature scaling. You can't scale to features smaller than you can um, uh, the, when, the, when the quantum effects take over. Uh, but when quantum effects take over, we need to use the quantum effects and, and, uh, and reap the benefits that, uh, that we can from, the, uh, from quantum computing. Uh, and in addition, of course, the optics in the chip um, and the new devices such as thyristors and, and other, other uh, yet to be determined components that are gonna be, um, gonna be activated or gonna be made possible by, um, by, by having a lot optical and electrical interactions occurring uh, you know, simultaneously in the chip. And there's, uh, finally, I wanna conclude with a, with a, um, a, a more graphic uh, description of of, um, of, of the Moore's Law trend and, and how this has played out over the last, um, well, ever since 1933, as, as a matter of fact. Um, and I, I've identified these timelines as when, when discoveries were made 
and, and when technology is matured. So the FET was, was first patented in, uh, in the uh, early 30s, and, um, and, and by the, by the mid-50s to 1960, it, it came into uh, commercialization in the form of these three devices. You had the JFET, MOSFET, and, uh, um, and MESFET, uh, both in uh, silicon and gallium arsenide, except for the MOSFET. The MOSFET was in silicon only. And you can see the, the enormous run that's, that the MOSFET has had from 1960 to the present. No other device could sustain that uh, kind of progress. Um, the MESFET, there was silicon MESFET briefly in the 80s. It died, it didn't go anywhere. Gallium arsenide MESFET uh, from the early 70s, um, it was a significant RF player, but then um, the heterojunction came along and um, all of those applications were carried over to the HEMPT and today the HEMPT is, is the premier RF device. But however, of course, the HEMPT doesn't have any optical capability, so its, its lifetime is pretty much up too. And that's right around now. So the HEMPT is, um, I think, destined to be um, you know, there, there's, there's no path forward for the hemp. On the bipolar side, 1948, uh, we had the discovery, and then there were silicon and gallium arsenide bipolars um, improving in performance up until the introduction of the heterojunction, and then the HBT became the dominant player, and that's carried us through to about the present. And um, again, the HBT, has reached the end of its, the end of its life of, of, of continuous improvement. Um, there's no more room for it to go. Right around 1982, um, we have the BICFET, and that was, that's our work, and it uh, triggered both the, the bipolar and the does thyristor, and then shortly after that, um, we learned that it was also a laser, so we have the BICFET laser, the does thyristor laser, and then over on the FET side, the MOSFET concept uh, was realized in gallium arsenide in the form of the NHFET, and then um, around 2004 in the form of the PHFET, and those two together become the CHFET, and you can see all the lines leading past 2015 are all poet devices, and that is what we call the new, um, the new poet paradigm. So, uh, with that, I, I I'll conclude and uh, hope that uh, it hasn't confused you too much, but given you a picture of where we think the the industry is going to go. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. At this time, we do have some, a few minutes for a question and answer period. And what I'll ask is that you please raise your hand and a volunteer will bring a microphone to your table. Let's begin with a few questions for Mr. Peter Copetti and then we'll move to Dr. Jeff Taylor. Questions for Mr. Copetti. Hi, Peter. Um, just for the shareholders here, um, since you took over the company two years ago, um, for all the shareholders watching, the stock prices have gone up almost 10 times. Um, and so uh, a lot of us wondering here are, do you think that stock price increase was justifiable? And uh, do you think it's justifiable for it to continue to increase at this rate going forward? That's a good question. Um, yeah, everybody's constantly watching the stock price. Um, it's funny, when I, if when I look back when we started uh, at the company, the variations in price on a daily basis today are the stock price when we got there. The stock will move 20, 30, 40 cents in a day, and uh, it was 20 cents when we were there. Um, I'd say last fall, 
I knew that we were a really focused team. Um, I, knew, I knew I had a great team. The stock was 50 cents. I didn't worry about the stock price. I don't worry about the stock price now. I've got Jeff Taylor and his science, and it's real and tangible. It's at the right time. Jeff gave you, you know, sort of, this is his version of a, a version he would give me. And this is, you know, lots of this stuff goes over my head. I'm a, you know, real operations and money guy. Um, so what he's done is he's got a, a, a great Lego box, better than anything that's out there. It is compatible with existing um, uh, foundries, so it's easily adaptable. And with that, with that, I've assembled a great team. So we've got Stefan Gagnon, Lee Shepard, Lee Pierol, myself, the Yukon team. And as long as I have those two ingredients and we continue to execute, I absolutely think that the stock is you know, is going to go higher. I think that stock is going to move from the lower left to the upper right over time. It's the opposite of Moore's Law. Moore's Law did this. Now Moore's Law is leveling out. And Moore's Law is going to go down. That's as the spend for Moore's Law goes up. That's why we're at the right time for Poet Technologies. It seems like, you know, this is a watershed moment. Five years ago, this may have not been possible because there were still improvements in Moore's Law. But right now, we can see that has dramatically stopped and slowed down. We see it in our end devices, we see it in the spend, and we get that feedback from the industry partners that we're under NDA with right now. The first thing they say, some of these guys on our calls, is tell us what you have. We need something, we need something new. So we're just in the right time and place. So that's, the stock may fluctuate you know, up and down a little bit, but I think we're definitely going higher. Hi, Peter. Uh, thank you for uh, you and the rest of the uh, POET team uh, being here today. Uh, my question is, um, what is the biggest challenge to POET, and how do you plan to overcome it in the coming months? So the biggest challenge for, for POET is for us on an operational level to stay focused. One of the great things about POET, it has so many applications. So if you look at CMOS, Silicon, you look at companies like Intel, AMD, optical electrical convergence, you look at JDS, Finisars, uh, the memory market is, is massive, sensors are raised in the military market, we're now doing in, you know, stuff in, in quantum, in, in the quantum area, and uh, there's stuff that we're working on in terms of IP that we haven't even disclosed to the market. But you know the team, the team is very small, we're a small company, so we can't attack that whole space at one time. We've got to be very careful, you know, how we go about it, who we partner with, we were coming out with our uh, Poet Development Alliances where you know, we, we basically put a group of companies to, together in order to develop you know, an end goal there, and that's what we have to stay focused with. We cannot um, dilute ourselves in terms of our assets, and the, the most precious asset we have is our personnel. Okay. Hi, Peter. Uh, one last question for you. If there was a severe market correction, how would that influence uh, Poet Technology strategy going forward? Another good question. A severe correction, I think, you know, obviously money flows. Um, you know, when there's a correction, you don't have the same money flows into the market. So, uh, you know, that could hurt us a little bit. Um, but we're a pretty unique uh, situation, so I feel we're insulated from a lot of the market noise. That's both on the upside and the downside. You could have a, you know, you could have the market going through the roof. If we don't execute, we won't participate. You know, it's not like we're one of those huge S&P companies right now. Um, I just think that um, uh, where it really could hurt us is, is if we had to raise money. If we needed money and the market was, you know, really going through a severe cor correction, as everybody in this room knows, the funds dry up pretty quickly, but we don't need money. We don't need to go to the market. Uh, like I said, we have an excess of 11 million in cash. We only burn about 370 a month. We run our ship pretty tight and we're very focused. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not so concerned about the overall market. I'm just concerned about execution. Over to Dr. Jeff Taylor. Do you have questions? Uh, Dr. Taylor, are there any um, limitations to the Poet chip? And, and what is the future of Poet's technology? Um, you know, Poet is a, is a gateway technology. You know, it, um, it opens the doors 
we, we don't know, you know, the, the end of the innovation based on poet, um, because you, you know, w w once you've got optical capability within your chip, um, you know, where you're doing uh, wavelength division, multiplexing, and optical filtering, and and um, you know, it, it's really a question of of innovation uh, with new algorithms. So it, uh, it it's almost like you know, in 1960, asking me, well, what are the limitations of CMOS? You know, you, you just say, well, it, it looks like there's a lot of really interesting things you can do, and, and we'll find out, you know? Um, you really can't uh, speak of it in terms of, of limitations because you're right at the threshold of something totally new. Um, the future, um, I think those slides, the last two slides sort of, tell you, you know, no one can predict the future, but, um, but what Poet can do for, for the future right now is uh, it looks, looks very bright. It can solve a lot of problems. And um, um, it, I think there's, you know, we're not going to be the only innovators. Once we get a, a chip released, some capability out there, there is going to be flooded with people coming up with you know, all kinds of patents on um, new things they can do because they've got an application that requires something that we haven't even looked at before and they see that they can use Poet to their advantage. So it really is an open script. Uh, my question is, how quickly can the world adjust from silicon to gallium arsenide, and is there any new manufacturing technology required for this transition? Uh, did I get that? I'm not sure I did. What was the question? Uh, my, my question is, uh, is there any new manufacturing technology required for this transition from silicon to gallium arsenide in the market, and how quickly do you think the world can adjust to this transition? Yeah. Um, no, actually, uh, one of the unique... Uh, Unique features of the poet is that uh, the, uh, the, the you know the the tool set is uh, pretty much synonymous with with silicon, so uh, there's very few uh, procedures that um, you know have not been used before that uh, that uh, the the industry is quite familiar with. I mean, whether we whether we do sputtering or or they do. Um, you know, uh, plasma deposition of a metal. Um, you know, there's nothing unfamiliar there. And then on, on uh, uh, you know, to, to go further, you know, the, the transition is going to be made almost, um, you know, in a seamless way if we can move um, the poet fabrication into an existing eight inch line. And that's, uh, I think, is going to be the sweet spot for the industry. Uh, they're going to start because 8-inch is currently in production for silicon and, and, and making money for, for, um, for the foundries, like Tower Jazz, a good example. Um, being able to, you know, perform the poet fabrication in, in such a line could be done with the, with the least possible uh, transition expense. Hi there. Um, does Poet have any competitors, and is it the only viable solution to the Moore's Law? Yeah, that's, um, you know, at this stage, I, I would say no. There's, uh, um, I don't think there's going to be two poets in the world. There's only going to be one, and, and this is it. So whatever... <laughs> However they do it, they're going to end up with Poet. Uh, Dr. Taylor, there seems to be a lot of industry attention on, on alternative materials, such as uh, graphene, for instance. Can, can you ex help us understand the, the difference or the difference approach? Are, are you more practical at this time period than something like graphene that could be decades away? Uh, you, you're reaching back into the past almost to where Seymour Cray was, using 3.5. Uh, help us understand 
where you might be in relation to something like graphene so, and some of the so other we, research. We want to consider uh, graphene as, a, as an alternative approach um, for doing logic and RF, for example, um, uh, but, but not optics. So the, we can rule, rule the optics out of that equation and then just focus on, on replacing high-speed performance, um, existing high-speed performance with graphene. Um, you know, you, you couldn't rule that out, but um, there's, uh, there's um, so many um, un, uh, unsolved problems or, or unknown answers for graphene, uh, graphene that um, it's, it's very dubious that, um, it's, it, you know, in spite of huge investments of, of, uh, of resources, that it's uh, ever going to capture any of the market. When all you have is, is a single high-speed transistor that is not uh, something you can build um, in, in, in existing, uh, you know, use, using the existing fabrication flows. So um, I, um, I'm not too, I don't see a big future for graphene, uh, not, not right now. And, it, and let, let's give it another 20 years and maybe something will, you know, will, will arise. We can't rule that out. But the fact that it, uh, that it doesn't address the optical problem, and the optical problem is, is the problem, you know. Um, we can't go further without improved connections, and you can't improve the connections unless you can perform the optical functions, you know, in, a, in, in the, using the economies of scale that you have in, in, in microfabrication. So, you know, intuition tells you that uh, it has, that's the way it's going to have to be. Would you say the optical technology of today and perhaps in the, in the next few years is up to the wear and tear requirements um, that might be inherent in an optical chip design, uh, for instance, in a cell phone? Oh, up to the wear and tear requirements? Speaking from more you of mean, a, a practical, practical as opposed to a theoretical uh, You mean you're talking about whether it's a robust? Another word for it. Oh, <laughs> dropping on the floor? Or you mean uh, that, uh, yeah, okay. Um, sure. I mean, uh, that's the nature of, of solid state and integration. You know, um, for example, uh, a huge problem with, with discrete components you know, or with your, this, this, this hybrid approach of packaging is um, you have a, a micron uh, tolerance in your optical alignment. You, you freeze that into place with some kind of a of an adhesive or some kind of a of a gel or something that you know that that uh, fi fixates the, the the location of a of an emitter to a to to a waveguide or or you know some something like that. Um, you can't do better than if if it had been manufactured, you know, to be self-aligned, for example. Any other way where it's done physically with a with uh, you know uh, mechanical constraints, is is bound to be more prone to uh, being dislodged, you know, and 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 alignment be, uh, going 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 south on you than um, than uh, the integrated approach. This no no contest. I know. Yes, uh, Dr. Taylor. Hopefully, one more question. Um, a year from now, do you see yourself working for Poet or working for Intel? Uh, well, I hope we have enough pride not to do that. But, uh, <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to call upon Mike White, President and CEO of IBK Capital Corp to give our, who's our presenting sponsor, to give the formal thank you. Madam President, distinguished head table guests, 
members and guests of the Empire Club of Canada. I have the pleasure to express our formal thanks to our two key speakers today, Peter Capetti and Dr. Jeff Taylor, and of course their company, Poet Technologies. Dr. Taylor, Peter Capetti, it is fitting that you have become part of the Empire Club's Spirit of a Pioneer series. You embody what it means to be a pioneer, as we heard earlier, the precise definition being one who helps to open up a new line of research or technology. Gentlemen, today you have spoken about a remarkable technology, that is poet. You and your team, many of whom are here today, are poised to take this technology and positively change the way we live our lives. In the years to come, powered by POET will mean our existing devices like smartphones, tablets, servers, and others will be faster and more energy efficient. It could reset Moore's law, as was discussed today, creating billions of dollars of new revenue for industry. For the future, powered by POET could mean quantum computing, ushering, in for, ushering forth untold technologies and devices that today only exist in the realm of science fiction. It is truly an exciting time for Poet Technologies. Thank you for visiting with us today. We wish you continued success in your endeavors, and we very much look forward to a future that is powered by Poet. Thanks, Mike. And as a token of our appreciation on behalf of the Empire Club of Canada, I would like to present both speakers with a copy of Who Said That? It's over 100 years of quotes and notes from the Empire Club of Canada. Final thanks, I would like to thank IBK Capital for their generous sponsorship this afternoon, and the National Post for being our print media, and of course Rogers TV. This meeting will be carried and aired live on, Ro or aired on Rogers TV, and we're grateful for that. We're on Twitter, Facebook, as well as our own web address, empireclub.org. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>